I think we will see a few coins coexisting at least for you know, 100 years into the future. Uh, past that, who knows? Samson, hi. Hi. Uh, nice to have you here. Uh, we have a special edition of Baltic Honey Badger 48 Show Series. So my first question usually is about the drinks that we drink with my guests. Today is water. Um, what is your favorite drink actually? I like rum and coke. Rum and coke. So next time we're doing another episode, I will bring rum and coke, of course. Sounds great. Um, I have a question about your background before you joined Bitcoin, before you joined the crypto community, what were you doing? What, what is your background? So I guess before uh, Bitcoin, I was uh, in the game industry. I'm still in the game industry. I have a game company. It's been operational now for eight years. Um, but uh, yeah, my background is doing real-time strategy games, AAA titles and stuff like that. And I just kind of fell into Bitcoin because I took an interest in it as it was very unique. You know, building online games, you're building uh, economies, but those economies are still largely tied to the game company. You're managing it. A lot of the more advanced MMO games, they'll hire like economists to help them manage the economy. Mm -hmm. So when I first learned about Bitcoin, it's very, very interesting because there's this digital currency that's not tied to any entity. It kind of lives on its own. It's almost as if it were alive. I read your recent, recent interview, you were mentioning that the gaming and the, and the crypto is like similar industries and can you like elaborate on that? Like where is the similarities with, with, between those two? The similarity I guess is just uh, for online games, there are economies and there are these you know, economies with uh, all the crypto assets out there now. But um, I think there is a strong tendency for gamers to be early adopters of technology. Mm -hmm. And they're very familiar with things like virtual currency, Linden dollars and digital currencies and just being able to own something and attribute value to something digital. So I think it lends itself really well to you know, crypto and Bitcoin because it's a natural transition. And I think there is definitely a lot of synergy between uh, a crypto asset, like a, a crypto token, being used in a game um, instead of like a centralized database system. So if you add a crypto asset to a game, so we're building a game called Infinite Fleet, mm -hmm. it's going to have a issued asset on Liquid, a utility token, a pure utility token. We're hoping that can kind of replace the in-game currency, kind of like the World of Warcraft gold. Mm -hmm. And we hope to see interesting player behaviors emerge from that because now you can do cool things like set up a, a guild with a multi-sig wallet that's controlled by a few players. Because in other games like EVE Online, they're centrally issued, centrally managed, and you have these cases where people will infiltrate a guild, play as part of that guild for a year, and then steal all their money. And that's just because they don't have something as trivial as multisig. Why did you actually join gaming industry? Was it like the passion that you like preserved from, from, from the early years or something like that? I actually got into the game industry because I was one of the top StarCraft players uh, in Vancouver at the time. So the guy at the, the game company, Relic, he knew me from, I guess, my reputation. And then he brought me in to start working on game balance. But it's just because I play a lot of games and I'm very competitive, so I like to play to reach top levels. And um, do you remember the point where you decided that you need to, like, also start researching Bitcoin and also getting deeper into Bitcoin and into crypto? Well, I kind of read about it and I was interested in it, but I was really busy at the time. I think I was still at Ubisoft when I first heard of it, but I was you know, doing a lot of business in Asia, launching games, and I didn't have time to really dive into it. I kind of got into it more reading-wise uh, and research-wise in 2014 mm -hmm. uh, because a friend of mine, Bobby, was doing a, a, an exchange and I was just reading in the news what he was doing and raising money to uh, expand uh, the exchange. It was called BTC China. Mm -hmm. And I guess that was when my interest started ramping up a bit more. I actually started trying to mine, I forgot which year, but I tried to mine on my laptop and I didn't get anything. But it's, it's hard like when you have like a full-time job and you want to get involved in something, it's, it's hard to take away time and really devote yourself. So did you bought your first Bitcoin or you earned it? I bought my first one actually. 
like at which price level because like I recently had an interview with Jimmy Song and he was mentioned like I heard about it multiple times and I thought like I need to buy now I need to buy now I need to buy now and then he missed some some of the opportunities but finally he bought it I think I got my first one at like 300 something <laughs> yeah so um, within the block stream you are chief strategy officer what is your responsibility? Because like, many people are asking what is Samsung doing within the block stream? What is so can you like describe this as well? So it, it's a very general title, I guess. Um, we picked it just because uh, there's a lot of different things needed to be done at Blockstream. And there's you know multiple areas that need attention. So when I first joined, my main focus was on liquid mm -hmm. and I helped kickstart the uh, mining initiative. So it's not like I came in to focus on very narrow areas, but more to help with uh, broad swaths of the company. So I oversee uh, business development, uh, uh, product, and uh, marketing. So it's a Good it's really broad. Yeah, it's very really broad. broad. But it ties together also because you're, we're, we need to productize a lot of the research and development we do. Mm -hmm. So Blockstream, as you know, is very heavy on the engineering side. We have a lot of mathematicians, cryptographers, and some of the top researchers and engineers in the space. But we haven't really taken that to create products that you know, the ordinary people can use every day. And I think Liquid, focusing on Liquid as a platform is the first step in that direction. Taking our research and development into side chains and creating something that exchanges find very useful. Mm -hmm. So Liquid, as you know, is an inter-exchange settlement or a side chain settlement network that links together exchanges. You have a faster block times once you've pegged in Bitcoin into Liquid and it can prevent things like congestion on the network, on the main network. Mm -hmm. If we can lay out this infrastructure, we can prepare ourselves before the next big bull run yeah. where you know, fees are gonna spike, you'll have millions of users coming on, exchanges are bottlenecked with KYC and onboarding users. You know, this is kind of a hedge on that to make sure we have this pipeline in place for when people wanna move Bitcoin quickly. Yeah, um, another question. Um, so. You're still, as far as I understand, with Pixelmatic, with your company, you're still doing some, something with, with them as well. You mentioned the Infinite Fleet. Yeah. Everyone is talking about it and like you mentioned that you will be able to uh, issue some tokens on the Liquid Network and it will be embedded in the, in the Infinite Fleet. Can you tell a bit, a little bit more about this mix? Sure. So. Uh, up until recently, the main focus of Pixelmatic was operating a game in uh, Asia. It was called uh, Vainglory. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a MOBA. Uh, but we started f shifting our resources into internal development. So we've been uh, building this game, Infinite Fleet. It's a MMO RTS. I think we're shifting the direction a bit to more action-y. But you're building this fleet of spaceships. And it's a persistent universe, procedurally generated. And you level up, and you're fighting in this massive war. But uh, the main purpose of Infinite Fleet is that we want to also dog food a lot of the tech that we're building at Blockstream. So if you saw earlier, um, I think last year at Consensus, we announced uh, Liquid Securities, which mm -hmm. is a securities platform that's building on top of Liquid. So Liquid itself is a blockchain, it's a platform, and we don't really monetize that at all. It's meant to be uh, a federation that's managing and governing itself. But what we will do is build these products on top of it. And Liquid Securities is one of the first ones. And this is just a way to issue security tokens. So Infinite Fleet is using that as well, uh, or the company Pixmatic is, is using that to raise capital. And we're following what we call a dual token model. So we're firewalling between the capital raise using a crypto token, which is the security token. Mm -hmm. And we have a utility token in the game, which is actually a real utility token. So it's not being sold to anybody. It's going to be generated from in-game events. And we think it will accumulate some value over time, just like any game currency, WoW Gold or you know, Linden Dollars will accumulate value over time. But um, it's really just taking a lot of the tech that Blockstream is building and leveraging it and proving it in the marketplace. We've been speaking about uh, the definition of cryptocurrency. You mentioned that it's like it's not defined yet. In your opinion, what is cryptocurrency? Like the closest that, that you can say, what is the cryptocurrency in your opinion? 
So I guess it's important to have these definitions because right now it is messy. You have this big bucket of things called cryptocurrencies and there's all sorts of things in there. You know, you have uh, Ripple, you have uh, ICO tokens, you have all sorts of different things. But, you know, Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency. It's a first of its kind, immaculate conception, etc. So I think it needs to, a cryptocurrency needs to be very reminiscent of what Bitcoin is. It should be a proof of work coin because there's energy being consumed. It's not what? just printed out of thin air. Not a proof of stake. Not a proof of stake. I'm not a fan of proof of stake uh, because there are a lot of issues. And the problem is with the proof of stake, it's so the issues are so complex, most people don't understand it. There's things like state grinding, um, uh, withholding your vote to manipulate the flow of a uh, token generation. There's a problem of snowballing where people holding large chunks of tokens get more and more over time because you know, the rich get richer. And then there's whole issue of uh, security as a whole, which proof of stake is not uh, able to counter adversarial conditions from other proof of stake coins. You know, They like to say, well, because everyone has a coin, they're incentivized to protect the network. But that's true of your network. But what if someone else creates a proof of stake coin? they're incentivized to use their capital to destroy your network, right? And then there's the whole issue of just perpetual energy or perpetual motion, which is people think that you can take away the energy and not waste that energy, but you lack the energy is what gives you security, right? If you take, for example, I know we're going a bit off topic, but if you take, for example, a pot of water and you put some, uh, you know, uh, some gold in there, right? And you boil the water, and you're consuming energy. That's kind of like proof of work. You're adding energy to this equation to derive security for something, right? But for a project like, say, Ethereum, they're saying, well, we're going to transition to proof of stake. And we're going to build this contraption to capture the steam from the boiling water and redirect that steam to heat the water. And that's how we'll be secure. But if you're familiar with the laws of thermodynamics, that's not going to work, right? So that's why if you really dig down and think about what proof of stake is, it doesn't really function at a core level. It's just an interesting concept with a lot of problems and people kind of pave over one problem and another one pops up somewhere else, but hope, they hope people don't notice the other problem coming up. But going back to your first question, like I think uh, what a cryptocurrency is, it, it should be a proof of stake coin it should be a fair distribution, and it should be reasonably decentralized that no one party can dictate exactly what happens with it. And if that is your definition, a lot of coins just fall out of that. They're just you know, shit coins. <laughs> yeah, true, shit coins. Uh, so what is Bitcoin for Samsung Mall? I think, uh, well, there's a few things. Like, if people ask me what is Bitcoin, I like to explain it to them as digital gold. It's a simple enough explanation that people can easily understand because people know what gold is. It's an asset, it's mined, and there are direct analogies to Bitcoin there. I think Satoshi himself used a lot of uh, analogies with precious metals when talking about Bitcoin in the early days. So that's an easy mechanism for me to teach people about what Bitcoin kind of is. But for me personally, I think Bitcoin is a way to prevent an Orwellian future. It's a way to stop uh, surveillance capitalism and tightening uh, restrictions on people's personal freedom, uh, privacy, and just well-being in general. So it does a lot. Like People like to joke, Bitcoin fixes this, right? Mm -hmm. But I think Bitcoin really does fix a lot of things. It's uh, apolitical money that no one nation state or country or um, company can control. And that's very transformative. It actually makes the people in control of their own destiny. People can vote with their own money. And that has a massive impact. You have a maximalist hat. Do you consider yourself a Bitcoin maximalist? Uh, I don't know. People call me a maximalist. I'm, I think uh, there are very hardline people in this space that hate every coin that's not Bitcoin, but I'm actually more tolerant. Like my, my upbringing in the space is running an exchange. You can't really run an exchange and I think be a, a super maximalist because then you'll only have one asset. And if you're really pure, then you shouldn't have fiat as well, right? <laughs> and then what do you do with Bitcoin? I think then you just be a miner. 
converting electricity to Bitcoin. But I, I think there are interesting projects out there. I like Monero. I, uh, contrary to what people may think, I like uh, Litecoin too. A lot of people hate Litecoin, but I see value in Litecoin, not just as like a, a test net. People like to call it a test net. But it's more like an advanced guard. We can actually try things in a system that has real value and that people actually care about. If testnet goes boom, nobody cares. But if Litecoin goes boom, some people will care. So it actually has more utility than just being a testnet, I think. And it's a way for us to prove out a lot of the tech in, that we want to bring into Bitcoin on a production chain first. So will there be like many coins in your opinion in the future or will there will be like only Bitcoin or where are we heading? Well, it goes back to the definition. <laughs> what is a coin? Is it something that... Well, you named like Monero, Litecoin, you do have other coins that most probably you consider crypto cryptocurrency. Yeah. So will they coexist with Bitcoin or at some point maybe Bitcoin will absorb the, be the best f features of those coins? It's hard to say. I think we will see a few coins coexisting at least for you know, 100 years into the future. Uh, past that, who knows, right? It could just be all Bitcoin in the future, but that also depends on how Bitcoin evolves. And as we've seen, it's hard to affect change in Bitcoin. It's a design feature of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be easy to change Bitcoin. So will we get confidential transactions in the Bitcoin base layer? Maybe not, maybe. It really depends, and no one can really foresee what's going to happen. Like, I think if you thought the scaling battle was bad, wait till the, the privacy wars start, right? That's when it's going to get messy. And I think the news out today was uh, because of FATF, uh, some exchange somewhere is delisting privacy coins, even though I think one of them is not very private, but they're delisting Monero and, and Zcash, which are, at least Zcash is kind of private, right? So. It's, a, it's really a tenacious period where we don't really know which way it's going to go. It could go this way or that way, but my hope is that we do get uh, privacy in it, the base there eventually. But it, it's just to illustrate the point. We don't know the future, and that's why I think it's okay to have other coins that are focused on uh, a specific feature set. And Bitcoin may absorb that feature set down the road, or it may not. But it's still nice to have a proof-of-stake coin, because I think if it's fairly launched, it's just a way for people to access uh, a cryptocurrency. Maybe there's different economies, different economies of scale, uh, there's different availability of different ASICs, um, but potentially, like say, a country bans cryptocurrency, you can't uh, exchange your rupees for Bitcoin anymore. Maybe you can mine Monero and exchange Monero for Bitcoin. But these fair proof-of-stake coins are not a bad thing necessarily, I think. You mentioned the privacy war, like upcoming privacy war. What, what, what does it mean? It's just uh, to see if we can get privacy in the Bitcoin space layer. I think there eventually will be a big push for it, but there will also be a push back because there are companies that need to deal with regulators and regulators may not like that because you know it interferes with surveillance capitalism or norms pertaining to money and if money is clean or dirty and you know do you know where it came from you mentioned that um, like some countries are actually banning bitcoin and some countries are actually issuing their own national currency or trying like for example china is now they they announced that they will release their own national cryptocurrency what is your opinion on that I think we'll see more of both of those things in the future. So India tabled a bill, I think. It didn't get passed. It was not a serious consideration. But you, you, I could see some countries banning it just because they're short-sighted. And it, Bitcoin is so transformative. You know, It's like digital freedom. It, it really brings freedom to people. You, you can bypass capital controls and every other mechanic imposed to maintain you know, taxation control on, on the people. And some people, some countries will resist that and they'll take heavy handed measures like that bill that was proposed. Um, other countries are looking at opportunities. They don't really understand what makes Bitcoin unique and they think it's unique because it's a cryptocurrency and they also want a cryptocurrency. But, you know, if your state rolled crypto is still 
limited, like not everyone can mine it or access it. Uh, it's still restricted between moving across borders, then it doesn't confer any unique benefit at all. And Basically, there's no difference between your no fiat difference. and your crypto. Yeah. So those will just, either they'll survive, just like, we already have digital currencies, right? Like yeah. when you bank, you know, or send a PayPal transfer, it's a digital currency. That would just be another form of digital currency. So it's either going to survive like that with restrictions, or and it's not going to change anything, or it's going to die off and they'll just revert back to, <laughs> they'll just save the effort. Like why roll a, a cryptocurrency when you can have a digital currency in a database? So in your opinion, Bitcoin would be able to coexist with the current financial system, or at some point maybe like we will just change it and the Bitcoin will replace everything. I'm tending to lean towards that latter statement. So I think Bitcoin is just going to replace everything. Like people love their freedom. Yeah. And that that's the end. That's the the end of it, right? People love their freedom. Uh, people tend to move towards being more free and participating in free systems than being in systems that uh, limit their freedom and make their lives worse, right? I think attempts from humans to govern other humans don't work that well. We kind of have this equilibrium where it works okay right now, but it's not ideal. And when you have people trying to enforce monetary policy and create monetary policy, that creates even more problems because people have very um, limited views and they're planning on very short time horizons, you know, planning to implement a policy that will get them elected again in the next election, rather than for the prosperity of a nation 100 years in the future. So it, Bitcoin is better because it's math. No one can change it easily, like we discussed. Uh, the rules are set. It's opt-in participation. You can always opt out and you know, fork off like people have done, and yeah. go to zero happily. We will speak about it. Sure, but I think it's inevitable that Bitcoin is going to just replace everything and that's hyper bitcoinization yeah what is your opinion on, on like forking bitcoin many many versions of bitcoin like bitcoin gold bitcoin cash all that stuff i think it's very important and i think it's important that people can do that what i really dislike is the fraudulent advertising around that and misleading people right if you want to fork because you don't like the bitcoin client you think uh you know block should be green Go for yeah. it, you know, yeah. make your own currency. The market can decide. I mean, that's the kind of the ethos behind Bitcoin, which is let the market decide. Opt in and opt out if you don't like it. And, you know, the forks are fine. And I've said it before, like I, I was on uh, Peter McCormack's thing. I said, there's nothing wrong with, with Bcash. It's just how it's marketed to people and deceiving people. It's just a coin, it's a chain, and you know, it's even a proof of work chain. So <laughs> there's nothing really bad about it inherently. It's just they're lying to people and tricking people and saying this is the real Bitcoin. So about the Bcash, there's a famous video when you're sitting on the conference nearby Roger Ver and he's saying something and you're like just just like rubbing your head. What he was saying in that moment? And what was the panel about? Do you remember this? Yeah, so it was supposed to be a panel with a few people, but apparently that was just to get me to agree to go on it. it they had always wanted just to be a, a de debate between me and Roger. And I don't even remember the context of the panel. It was probably about Bitcoin and scaling, even though the scaling debate was over at that time. The market had decided and Bcash was like sub 10% of Bitcoin. Uh, but Roger's statement was, babies are dying. And uh, yeah, that was... Not fun sitting next to him for 30 minutes. What's your opinion on Roger Ver? You know, the guy went from being uh, like one of the famous people in Bitcoin and, and the person who was actually pushing the brand or the Bitcoin into the masses, being like so-called Bitcoin Jesus to actually becoming one of the biggest villains in the Bitcoin history. Mm -hmm. So I think some people have this perception that he was a good guy early on and you know, he was doing a lot of things for Bitcoin. But I actually think he was just a guy pumping his bags the whole time, right? And he just pumps different bags at different times. So, you know, when there was only Bitcoin, he pumped Bitcoin. You know, he bought ads and tried to get adoption. But was that for Bitcoin itself or was it for his own financial gain? 
I think it's for his own financial gain. Because if you look at his pattern of behavior, it's just, you know, pump Bitcoin, okay, I'm gonna pump Dash, I'm gonna pump this thing, and there's just no end to it. You mentioned that you've been working also um, in, in exchange, so basically you were, in what particular exchange you were working? It's a BTCC or BTC China. So um, it's a Chinese exchange as far as I understand. Yes. And at some point Chinese authorities banned Bitcoin and then they had this really crazy story about exchanges, some exchanges closed. Was it like, how do you think, was it, what was the reason behind that? Was, what's the, Bitcoin becomes a threat to Chinese authorities or something like that, or they just like wanted to prepare the ground for their own state cryptocurrency? Well, like I said, I don't think that's going to change anything. It's not a game changer, the state cryptocurrency. Um, and there's also a misconception, misconception that the China banned Bitcoin. They didn't actually ban Bitcoin. Ownership of Bitcoin is still fine. Mm -hmm. They just uh, prevented banks from dealing with exchanges. Uh, that was actually before the, uh, the end of the exchanges. But it, it had been tightening up for some time. And the end point was more of a closure of exchanges. They didn't want there to be crypto to fiat exchanges anymore. So the exchanges had to wind down operations and a lot of them have since moved overseas and operate overseas now. But the rationale, it's hard to say. I think it could be many things. One of them is just uh, it's a way to bypass capital controls, right? You still have capital controls and if you can exchange, uh, you know, Chinese yen for Bitcoin, that's effectively bypassing it. But ownership of Bitcoin is not banned. Um, there's actually been a legal case in Shenzhen that established uh, protections for uh, a digital asset like Bitcoin. I think there was a theft and they ruled that, yes, you can't steal that. It's a protected asset. So I can't really say why, but I, my guess is that it's to do with capital controls. Mm -hmm. Also, back then, if, you're, if you remember, the volumes of the Chinese yeah. exchanges was pretty crazy. Um, and that drew a lot of attention. Uh, you're also wearing the Tether uh, t-shirt. Why? Because I love Tether. Why you love Tether? Uh, well, a lot of people criticize uh, my support for Tether. Like, there's a lot of FUD about Tether in, in the Twitter sphere, right? People like to throw FUD at it. There's a guy, Bitfinex, who loves to throw water on Tether. And I think a lot of that is unfounded. So a lot of the times I take a position and I defend Tether because I don't find their arguments rational. Like if you remember when they're talking about um, Tether being fractional because funds are frozen, they just focused on, you know, it's fractional because Bitfinex had to uh, borrow money, right? And that's why Tether is fractional. But the point is, it was fully backed at that time. They just borrowed from it, mm -hmm. which should illustrate that it's fine. It's solid and reliable. But you know, the Fudsters love to throw stuff around. So I generally will support Tether because I think it. No one's speaking up. So then people will say like you're you know, a Tether supporter or whatever. So I might as well just embrace it and wear the shirt, right? Yeah, but recently Tether, as far as I understand, uh, they released uh, their tokens on the Liquid Network. Yes, yeah, so Tether is now available in the Liquid Network. Um, you know, I think it's a good move because we've seen it clogging Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 50% uh, of Tether transactions are on Ethereum now, and it's already pushed Ethereum fees to new all-time highs. So it can't even handle 50% of Tether transactions, much less everything else. Uh, whereas on Liquid, it's a, it's a network focused on financial transactions, not computing things with a blockchain like Ethereum is doing. So we won't have those same congestion issues as uh, they do. You participated in the Lightning panel here on Honey Badger. And know, like previously when we discussed where you want to speak on which topics, you mentioned specifically that you want to speak about Lightning. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, why I want to talk about Lightning? Yeah. Because I think Lightning is very important and a very critical piece of scaling technology that will allow us to get Bitcoin into the hands of billions of people. Uh, 
Uh, if everything is done on chain, you're limited. Even with things like a side chain, there is still some limit because everything is being broadcast to the network. Every transaction has to take up space in a block. And this is real space that you're consuming. Whereas with Lightning, you're offloading a lot of that because you're only talking to who you're transacting with. Uh, the rest of the network doesn't need to know. So it's much more scalable. And uh, I think we had a benchmarking test done. Uh, Dr. Christian Decker did this test. He found that a one lightning channel has a theoretical capacity of 500 transactions a second. So when you know all these other blockchain projects are out there advertising, you know we have a thousand, we have ten thousand transactions a second. None of that really matters because you know Bitcoin is a settlement network. If you want a retail network, that then that transaction per second metric really does matter. But then Lightning will blow any metric you can reach on a blockchain away because it's channel based. So I think right now with uh, the amount of channels we have on the network. If you just uh, take uh, 250 transactions per second per channel as a baseline, just to be more conservative, you can have about 18 million theoretical transactions a second. And what that means is you've actually exceeded even centralized systems like uh, Visa, Alipay, or WeChat Pay, which I think top out at 70,000 transactions a second or 80,000 transactions a second. So what you have now is this paradigm shift where Decentralized systems like Bitcoin with Lightning have exceeded any centralized database system in existence. And that is pretty big. And it's even better because now we can have Bitcoin uh, being transacted over Lightning. And this jump starts what I call the circular economy, which is people can now earn Bitcoin and spend Bitcoin in a cycle. Uh, instead of getting paid at the end of the month or after two weeks, you can get paid at the end of the day. And then you go and buy your dinner and buy coffee, buy groceries, watch a movie, go back to work, earn more money and spend it. And Lightning enables that. And I think that is the key to, that's one of the keys to hyper Bitcoinization and to mass adoption. It's got to be frictionless and easy. Uh, the interesting point about Lightning, you didn't touch this on the panel, but um, many people say that Lightning will take profits from miners. Do you agree with that? Not really, but it's a valid concern. Um, I've, I know a lot of miners because I used to run a mining pool at BTCC um, and uh, you know, Blockstream is also involved in the mining space. But a lot of miners do think this is going to take away my revenue because now people are going to transact off-chain instead of on-chain. Uh, but what I do is like when I meet them, I tell them it's more about growing the pie because this pie of block space is finite. You can increase it and have gigamegs, <laughs> Giga it doesn't really <laughs> matter in the end because then you'll be centralized into uh, a few data, a few warehouse, data warehouses or uh, Amazon or something, right? But what it, Lightning does is it makes Bitcoin have more utility. And Lightning actually needs on-chain transactions, right? You cannot have a Lightning network with no on-chain transaction. You need to open a channel and you need to close a channel. And the way to think about it is, well, the way to think about it properly is, Lightning is aggregating transactions because you have many off-chain transactions, but it's also aggregating the fees because you're paying more for these uh, channel openings and closings. So the way I would describe it is, Lightning users are VIP customers of the miners. They're incentivized to pay more because they want to make sure that uh, the channel that, that they don't time out before they get a confirmation, and they derive much more utility from a, an on-chain transaction. Because once you've opened the channel, you gain you know, virtually unlimited transactions off-chain. So there's a, a far more yield of utility than a single or many on-chain transactions. Isn't Liquid a competing technology with Lightning? So not many, really. Many people who, who like not sophisticated, they think that these both technologies are competing because they are both side chains or they're both like off chains. Yeah. So they're both off chain solutions, I guess, but Liquid does have a chain still. But I don't think they're competing at all. Liquid 
and I guess liquid-like networks would be more for settlement for a specific purpose, which in our case is for trading. So for liquid, you still have block times and confirmations. It's uh, one minute block times. It's faster than uh, Bitcoin main chain. And we don't have that variance because we're not a dynamic membership multi-party uh, signatures. We're a federation of fixed members, right now fixed, but we can generate a block very quickly because we know who the members are. And there's no need to have like uh, a time to sync up, which the 10 minute block time is really just a, just a time for that network to keep in sync with one another. So you, you minimize that, but it still takes time. With Lightning, it's instantaneous. But also with Lightning, you have hot wallet risk. Your keys are online. So I don't see any case where you would replace I don't see where an exchange would replace uh, you know, liquid or on-chain transactions with all lightning because that's a lot of hot wallet risk. With liquid, you still have your buckets, right? You, have, you accept Bitcoin, you accept liquid Bitcoin, but you still manage your Bitcoin hot wallet and your liquid hot wallet. So you can still minimize your risk in that way. But with Lightning, you know, first of all, you have capacity issues, but then you're still online. So I don't think they compete. Lightning is more for retail mm -hmm. and micro nano payments. You mentioned hyper Bitcoinization. Uh, can you like give a definition? What is it? I think what uh, is the concept? Th there's of a lot this? of definitions. One is that you know, Bitcoin is going to become a million dollars and it's going to blow up. The other one is uh, once you've reached hyper Bitcoinization, there's just no need to convert back to fiat. So is it only about the price, or it's about replacing other like financial systems only with one Bitcoin? Both people have said both, but I think it's more about replacing the fiat system, like completely. So you don't need to coexist with it. It's just you know people don't want to go to fiat anymore, and you just transact in Sats. Final few final questions. Um, the, the Bitcoin culture is actually also famous for uh, memes and for hats and you are one of the famous people who produce actually hats that everyone wears. What, it's your hobby or what are, what, why are you doing this? So I actually made hats um, for my StarCraft guild back in the day, back in like 1999. So I, I, I do like making hats and designing stuff. And I actually made one for fun uh, back at the, during the scaling wars. I made the Make Bitcoin Great Again hat, kind of riffing on the Make America Great Again hat. And then from there, I just uh, kept on iterating. So uh, each one of my hats is kind of like an art piece. It's uh, like there are hats out there that just say Bitcoin on it. And it doesn't really say anything. It's like, I have Bitcoin, come and rob me, right? But I like to kind of have subtle messages. They're inside jokes or they're poking fun at somebody or they're to kind of uh, galvanize a movement. So, you know, I had the Dragon's Den hat. That was when, uh, during the scaling wars, I think Bram Cohen had a, his screen at a presentation and it popped up this chat room called Dragon's Den. And, uh, you know, the uh, conspiracy theorist, Bcasher guys, they said, you know, there's a secret group controlling Bitcoin. It's called the Dragon's Den. So I made the Dragon's Den hat just to laugh at them. And people like to wear it because it shows that, you know, I'm in the club and everyone's in the Dragon's Den, right? Uh, I made the uh, UASF hat. That was when people were trying to activate SegWit. And that was popular because people wanted an outlet to express themselves, to express their view. Because you have things like minor signaling where I can signal a BIP. But for the average you know, Bitcoin user, how do I tell people you know, I want this and we need to activate this? And it's popular because you can take a picture of yourself and use it on your profile on Twitter and show people that you support this thing. So, a few final questions. Um, in your opinion, who is Satoshi Nakamoto? I think it doesn't matter. And I don't think uh, Satoshi is anybody that we know of in the space. So, you know, there's speculation. Some people say Adam Back is Satoshi. Uh, some people will say Nick Zabo is Satoshi or Hal Finney. I don't think he's any person that is either been around or is around today. It's probably someone else and they're very smart, they have great OPSEC and they disappeared. And if they're still alive, then they're watching from afar, but you know, they 
it's not somebody that you can pick up and put in a chair and interview. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, but if you would have any opportunity just like to, to know who, who he is or she is or they are, would you use that opportunity? No, because I don't see any benefit. It would be bad for them, bad for their OPSEC, and you know it would cause a lot more problems because people may assume that they still have access to their keys and you know target them or you know there's many bad situations that can happen if Satoshi actually surfaced today. But I was going to add actually, Satoshi is definitely not Craig Wright. <laughs> We are all Satoshi except for Greg Wright. And final one, um, I ask everyone to make a Bitcoin price prediction. Just choose a date or year in the future and just, and please like support your statement why you think that the, the, the price should be like this. Okay, let's see. I, I used to make price predictions and I was pretty accurate up until the big bull run. I thought we would re we recover and go up to 30k so I made that mistake and uh, I generally try to predict further out now so I correctly predict, predicted 3k and I predicted 7k in the past <laughs> which was lucky for me I guess but I think in five years we'll definitely be at 100k and within 10 years we'll be somewhere around 500k if not more thank you thank you it was a pleasure thank you thank for you. having me Great to be on your show. Thanks.